The Charlotte Hornets did something. They exercised free agency and trading at the same time to improve their roster. Novel concept. We talk about the addition of Josh Green today on Locked On Hornets plus this. And Hornets are going to be a top four seed. Come up next. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no qualifiers. We're going to the playoffs, baby. You are Locked On Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cuz we live. It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcast, and that includes YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can make every moment more. As playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to, but this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right, there's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. There's something for you right there. Doug Branson, Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. He's texting you there as well. You can find the subtext information on his Substack with a picture of Doug eating a sub from Subway. I'm Walker Mail. You Eat can fresh. listen to me on WFNZ. Listen to me every day from 12 to 3 p.m. Also, your WFNZ app. The Hornets did something, Doug. All that poking and prodding with the stick, telling them to do something. They finally did it. And yes, that's even after the draft. Because they would select somebody. They wouldn't just forfeit their pick. Technically, they were supposed to do something every single NBA draft, and they did. But then free agency would roll along, and they didn't have to, and they did it. This is the time that they did with Jeff Peterson as the EVP, Executive Vice President of Basketball Operations. Gabe Plotkin, Rick Schnall, Schlotkin, as we like to call him. They trade for Josh I don't know Green. if they like us to call him that. Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true, but we're doing it anyway. Schlotkin, Jeff Peterson, everybody involved with the Hornets, they trade for Josh Green as a part of the Clay Thompson to the Dallas Mavericks deal. And in order to get Josh Green, all they gave up was a couple of second round picks. Doug, it feels just like a good piece of business for the Hornets. Doesn't mean they're going to be a top four seed next year. But if you want to see good, smart decisions stacked on top of one another, this is thrown into the pile. So let's talk about what a Josh Green is, because I'm not sure that a lot of folks are even familiar with Josh Green because he played sort of a smaller role on that Dallas Mavericks team. Important role at times, but smaller role. So he's a shooting guard, 6'5", 200 pounds, uh, versatile defender, point of attack defender. I mean, I think one of the main things this does for the Hornets in the short term is that it gives them a guy that can give LaMelo Ball and Brandon Miller a little bit of breathing room uh, to improve their defense because both those guys have to improve but this gives you somebody that you can put on the best guard on the other team you can hide Lamelo and, and Brandon a little bit as they as they continue to progress it allows you to play Brandon Miller at three which is I, I think is ultimately going to be you know his position of strength as he grows into that uh, I think it also gives you somebody that projects as an improved shooter on low volume someone that's been Really good in in transition, particularly with his passing. I think that's the thing that's going to shock a lot of folks. I was talking to Nick Angstead of Locked On Mavs, and that was like the one skill that I think even Mavericks fans uh, were were a little bit surprised with is his ability to move the basketball, not just in transition, although I think that awareness is really good, but also even in the half court, just the drive and the kick. I know, Walker, you you looked at some film and saw something on his finishing as well. Yeah, I mean, he's been a very good finisher at the rim uh, pretty much his entire career, which is nice. And he gets there pretty frequently. Last year, his role changed with all the shooting and then Luka and Kyrie taking over. And so he didn't get to the rim as much. But even still, when he got there, he was able to shoot pretty well. If you go to cleaning the glass, all the numbers are there that has him at the high percentile shooting accuracy frequency got there in the 55th percentile. But before he was towards the top of the league, like towards the top 20th percentile or 80th if you but you get the idea so he was finishing really well and he got there quite a bit even if it's not necessarily off the dribble all of the time this is somebody that's going to be set up by smart basketball players in Lamelo and Brandon Miller theoretically cutting assisted on a lot of his attempts so he's not a high usage player and the other thing I like that I tweeted out about, he played with a couple of high usage guards in Luka Doncic and yep. Kyrie Irving. Like that's going to be coming in seamlessly into a role here and fitting pretty nicely in this puzzle because Brandon Miller and LaMelo Ball 
Those are going to be the guys that have the basketball in their hands most of the time, rightfully so. You just need somebody that can cut and can shoot. Like, Doug, he takes the right kind of shots. And I think some fans were a little frustrated with his reluctance to take some of the shots. They wanted him to take more, particularly from three when he was open, and maybe he would pass those up. But, man, if you look at the shot chart, he is the analytic dream, right? Sure. Not the dream, maybe because the free throws aren't there, doesn't get to the foul line all that much. But he takes threes, he gets to the rim, and I'm good with that. And he's good at both on low volume for sure, low usage player. That's just what it is. But he's good at both, and he's strong. Uh, we finally have some beef in the backcourt. Yeah, physical. Yeah. So, like, it's it, LaMelo and Brandon, they could hula hoop through a Cheerio, right? Very skinny. Josh Green, somebody that has some beef to him. Yeah. I. $12 million, tradable contract, worthwhile contract, only for two seconds. Uh, yeah, they're not yeah. going to be a top four. I just, they're not going to be a top four seed because of this election. <laughs> But like it's just good business. Why, why so do you have refreshing. to qualify? You keep you keep feeling the need. This I think this is the radio text line getting to you. You feel That's the right. need to qualify right. this as like not it's not a huge maneuver, but we've been preparing fans on this show for this kind of free agency for a couple of weeks now, where there was there wasn't going to be a big fish. There wasn't going to be a big move that would get them into playoff contention. We didn't expect that. Um but this is as you said. They got Josh Green from Dallas, a team that didn't want to give up Josh Green at not. the trade deadline for P.J. Washington. The Hornets wanted Josh Green at the deadline. Schlotkin uh, identified him along with all of these other players that they were they were trying to acquire. They ended up settling on Grant Williams, who gave them major contributions last year and looks to do the same this season. And then they waited, waited, waited for Dallas to lose the finals, get a little bit more desperate, want to upgrade their shooting guard position. They wanted Clay Thompson. Golden State wanted a trade exception. They didn't want to take back any more salary. They wanted the opportunity to upgrade their roster. And so here come the Hornets taking advantage of an opportunity. They give up two seconds. They got, what, three seconds for Reggie Jackson in that deal that that gave Denver some salary cap relief. So it's just, again, looking for these opportunities. Jeff Peterson and company have been very savvy so far, um, and, and you just got to take your hat off to them right now if you understand what the plan is. The plan is not let's suit up and get ready to like compete with Boston and Philly and Miami for the East next year. The plan is take these opportunities to acquire assets that, as you said, are movable. Like Josh Green, best case scenario, he because he has holes in his game. Let's not get it twisted. Like he's he can be a reluctant shooter, he can be a streaky shooter. And, you know, defensively, there's some issues like moving through screen sometimes. Like, it's not like he's an elite defender. It's just he's a plus defender on a team in the Hornets that had two plus defenders. Cody Martin, who didn't play all that often, and Mark Williams, who didn't play all that often. So, you know, and Josh Green, I think pretty durable, right? If I'm looking, games played. I uh, played 57, but I don't know how much of that was injury and how much of that was just falling out of the rotation. With Which, you know, falling out of the rotation is for a reason, and you enhance your roster at the deadline to go for an NBA Finals trip, but it, it actually, it, it's not like he ever fell completely out for a really long time, even in the playoff run. He would get back in when they wanted this jolt and actually performed decently well, like was leading their team and scoring for a significant portion of a playoff of finals game. So still not scared of the moment when he was thrust back into that position. But look, the team keeps telling us that they're bringing all of these player development folks. Charles Lee, player development coach. He's filled his staff with player development coaches. And, and just like the salon pick in the first round, to me, this is the front office telling Charles Lee, all right, you're a player development coach. Let's see it. Let's see you take Josh Green and improve it. Because here's the thing. Best case scenario, he's improving your team short term. You get a little bit better, and you're developing your other players as well. And that contract, as you said, he's making 12.6 this year, 13.6, 14.6 in the final year. That becomes an extremely valuable trade ship to further improve your roster, possibly acquire more assets in the draft, or go after that big fish eventually. Yeah, last couple things as far as the evaluation on him goes. You know, tons of corner threes last year and even in previous seasons. It's easy to see with Luka 
Dallas they love having Luka drive and then just throw one-handed fireball baseline passes to the corner. We saw him do it in Charlotte. It was one of the more impressive things I had seen live in the Spectrum Center in quite some time, and he was on one in that game. But Green could be the beneficiary there. LaMelo Ball, same thing, right? Just drive, kick, Josh Green, spot up shot. And we need some corner three help, by the way. Like, it's just been this weird thing. We've talked about it every now and then, but we didn't really shine a light on it all that brightly. But this team hasn't been great with their accuracy shooting from the corner. So if Josh Green, he, he was okay. Like he was, I think, right at the 50th percentile. Lots of attempts, but just right there, average at knocking him down. I'll take it, though. Like that's totally fine. Average isn't bad. So if you're just knocking more shots down from the corner, like 39%, something like that last year, then that's also another positive. And the other thing that you could identify with him and this team, they got a type, Doug. They love themselves some high motor basketball players because that's what Josh that's Green it. is. And they are spreading that message all over the organization and the Queen City. We will go after Salon at six overall because his intensity is through the roof. We will draft KJ Simpson because his intensity is through the roof. And then after he gets drafted, he says, I'll run through a brick wall and has one of the best post draft interviews of any player selected. Well, he's now already going- injured, so we don't need I know. to run. I, I, I just need to get the I message know. to him. Don't run through any brick walls. Josh Green, same thing. No brick walls. Yeah. Uh, keep it safe. They got a type, but every, se- I mean, they're sticking to it. They're walking the talk right now and who they value, and they are setting a competitive nature. That's when you go culture change and then you just go after all the dudes that try hard 110 percent of the time yeah man i welcome that with open arms here you're right about the driving kick stuff though i mean it was because the hornets had no problem getting into the paint it was what happened after that because they couldn't finish at the rim they were missing a ton of layups and then when they would kick it was more like drive and kick you in the because they couldn't hit a shot (laughs) <laughs> you've done that before i asked you to elaborate i won't now um all right you know what bleep it man hornets are going to be a top four seed coming up next <laughs> oh, yeah co- no co- qualifiers we're going to the playoffs it, baby it, it's it it's written in stone coming up next on the lockdown <laughs> hornets podcast don't go to sleep on the hornets just yet i have a take that might go the other way just a little bit just a little bit with a little bit of just allowing myself to think negative thoughts and i'm hoping doug can talk me out of it we'll see if he can on the other side of the break on lockdown hornets this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. i love sports i know you love them too i love them so much i never really want them to stop but as the playoffs wind down we get fewer games and the sports aren't sporting like i want them to but FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever i want and all i have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime i'm in the mood and this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily that's right there's something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. More Locked On Hornets ahead. One more thing on the drive and kick, the corner three stuff. I was looking for the stat in the first segment, but if you look at just the frequency in which the Hornets were shooting corner threes, they were towards the bottom in the league. Dallas was number one. They were taking the most corner threes of anybody in the NBA. And then if you go to accuracy, Charlotte was already towards the bottom in frequency. They're even worse in accuracy. They were 29 out of 30. Memphis, the only team worse. And so Josh Green going to help them out. If the offense dictates itself to that, if Charles Lee starts to experiment with that more, Josh Green is somebody that is in that role, Doug. And I mean, average on this team, from corner three is a beautiful thing because they haven't been that the last couple well, of years. Well, it's the same thing defensively. Like you can, yeah, you know, That's getting right. the scouting report from Nick Angstead of of Locked On Mavs. You know, he was poking some holes in the defensive part of his game, and I'm like, that's that's fine like you can do that <laughs> yeah. like if you're an elite team mm-hmm. but if you're not an elite team you gotta you gotta take what you can get oh so. but did he try though nick well yeah <laughs> perfect okay Sign up. <laughs> welcome so i did have some intrusive bad thoughts doug i don't know if you okay can help okay me out. you have some intrusive bad thoughts i want to hear those and then i have a few questions for you okay that yeah intrusive bad thoughts so you mentioned it in the first segment The Hornets went after Josh Green, a part of the negotiations in the P.J. Washington trade deal, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted Josh Green. Dallas didn't want to give him up, and so they settled for the high first-round pick, top two protected, and that was a huge asset. Hell yeah, welcome. 
You know who wasn't a part of the organization at that time? That I knew they, this is where you were going. Yeah. I knew this is where you were going. <laughs> you, you know who wasn't a part of the organization at the time that they inquired <laughs> about Josh Green the first time? Jeff the executive, Peterson. That's right. The executive vice president of basketball operations, who was supposed to be your head decision maker, Jeff Peterson. He was not a part of that org at that point. And now that he is the head decision maker, what do you know? What a coincidence. Josh Green still ends up on the roster. I talked with Mac earlier on the Mac and Bone Show. And I said, I don't want to be the monkey that questions why the cookie shows up when I ring the bell. I should just enjoy the cookie. It's tasty. I love it. Who doesn't love cookies? Is there the process that I should be questioning here as to why it shows up? No, just eat it. It's fine. Is that going on with me, Doug? Should I question it? Or should I just eat it and enjoy it and shut up and take my Josh Green cookie? So I think as long as the cookie tastes good, and as long as the ingredients in the cookie aren't wildly different than what you've been expecting, then I think you absolutely should eat your cookie and shut up. <laughs> okay. Because, be, because mm. here's – okay, so I, I understand, and I think it's important to allow the bad thoughts in. You can't avoid the bad mm -hmm. thoughts. That's, that's a problem. That's just burying feelings. You've got to allow them in, and then you've got to let your rationalization part of your brain take over. And that part of my brain is saying, look – Certainly, Schlotkin had to have conversations with Jeff Peterson in the lead up to his hiring. I agree. And there was this there is... were things expressed, ideas expressed, rumors that that Peterson probably already knew about. Um, and and they had to sort of you know head shake, nod, wink, wink. Like we like Josh Green, right? Wink, wink. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, let's I'm with let's you. go forward. You know. Yep. No, total, that that's the saving grace. And I thought about that too because what was it when Mitch said? The comment about how he was surprised at how much intel Schlotkin had on some of the players and, and probably even specifically Rick Schnall because he's just been doing this for a lot, a lot longer. And he has the relationship with Jeff Peterson. There was no prior relationship between Gabe Plotkin and Jeff Peterson. But if, if Jeff is like looking to get this job and he might have an inside track, <clears throat> then it would be in his best interest to set himself up for possible success. And so he's like, hey, if you, if you can throw Josh Green into the deal, that would be great. And I have to imagine that Rick and Jeff were talking. So that's the saving grace for me, too. It's that they were all on the same page even before Peterson was here in the Spectrum Center slash Lowe's building because of renovations. Yeah, now there is the potential for this to go wrong because people get upset with the owners meddling when the team is bad. I mean, I didn't hear a lot of people complaining about Mark Cuban's meddling when the Mavs were winning uh, a few championships here and there. But when, when things go awry, that's when people... Now, I would have been upset if, you know, they would have gone out and done what Washington did and signed Jonas Valanciunas or, I mean, they could still go after DeRozan. There are like two or three cats that have been linked with the Hornets. Like Drummond, I think, is out. So he, I think he got signed. Uh, Tobias Harris, another name. DeRozan. There are a couple of these other names that have been linked with the Hornets in the past that if they were to suddenly end up on the roster, I would be like, yeah, what's, what's going on here? But Josh Green is <laughs> yeah. not one of those names. Like it, no. it all makes sense. So as long as it keeps making sense, mm -hmm. I'm going to be I'm going to be a little bit concerned, but I'm not going to be concerned enough, you know, to make a big stink. About and, it. and the messaging, too, probably doesn't help you because the messaging has always been we're a team. We're in this together. It's never been this is Jeff's team. It's never been that. It's never been this is my responsibility. So all right, yeah, well, whatever. Uh, okay, you I, have have questions. Questions. Okay, I have a few yeah, questions. Yeah, what are your questions? Shoot. How does this affect Does the Josh Green acquisition affect the Miles Bridges negotiations in any way? I do not think so. Um, I think now, and maybe you have a better understanding, but as far as the new CBA uh, goes, to my understanding, you can trade for a player and use your mid-level exception. 12.8 is allowed with the MLE. Josh Green is making 12.6. So that would eat up all of your MLE if you're absorbing him into the mid-level exception, which means you still have all the cap space in the world to work some kind of deal with Miles. Even if it wasn't, like, I just... They're not necessarily the same position. You're talking about somebody smaller with Josh Green, who if you're talking about versatility, you're looking at what? Like two through three for Green. For Bridges, we know what it is with him. We're looking for three through four, maybe desperate times center, but it's three through four. So no, uh, short answer, I do not think that it affects Miles Bridges all that much. I, I would say that they're still looking to figure out what to do with Miles. 
No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think this affects it at all because you have Bertans contract that can be restructured. There are a number of ways that they could make this happen because the Hornets yeah. really they aren't capped out unless they want to be. So um, there's there's no issue there. I agree on the fit. And the other thing too is I think the offer for Bridges is on the table, right? I mean, I mm-hmm. think this there's an offer that's probably this is pure speculation, but it's probably similar to the offer that they had on the table for him. Uh, prior to him uh, in the previous offseason, prior to him accepting the qualifying offer. <laughs> and so that offer is sitting there. If Miles Bridges wants to take it, he can. Uh, and he's, you know, doing what I think he should do, which is go and explore the market. The market right now so far has said, well, wow, we're good. And, you know, then then it becomes, all right, is there a sign and trade opportunity? So, yeah, I don't think this uh, – now, there is an interesting thing where the Hornets have – like a couple too many players right now. We have to see where the two ways shake out, but like yeah, roster spots, the Hornets, th- th- that's why I say like, th- and this would be my next question, are they done? And I think the answer is probably no, right? Because they've got to figure out, you know, uh, wh- which of these players are moving out and which are staying around. Still, I mean, they, it, Josh Green is still, it's it's wing and also like guard forward. Like he, it, he, he still has a little bit of that backcourt flexibility, which means that you still have a lot of backcourt players. Um, do you have another question for me? That was it. Are okay. they done? Yeah, but I, 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 think I, the, I think the answer is clearly no. They've got some more moves, whether it's a, whether it involves a Miles Bridges sign and trade or it's, you know, we had a rumor from Fisher that the Zeke Naji, who's a power forward that's sort of buried yep. on Denver's bench right now, that his $8 million contract could be used to acquire Vasa Micic because they need guard help, but then Russell Westbrook has also been linked to Denver. But I, but I think there's still some maneuvering to do because the problem with the Hornets roster, as you, as you look at it now, is you're right. They have too many guards. Like they've, you still got to figure out Trey Mann, Vasa Micic, uh, Cody Martin, Nick Smith Jr. Where does he fit into this mm-hmm. whole equation? And they don't have enough, uh, particularly if they don't bring Miles Bridges back, they don't have enough forward help. Still have some work to do for sure. Um, let's continue. There's still lots of stuff to talk about with this trade coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Yeah, maybe we dabble in to how the rotation is affected with Josh Green's presence. Not only who are the guys that are on the outside looking in, but even the guys we expect to make the roster. Do any of them get less playing time? We'll give you our finishing thoughts on Josh Green. Plus, yeah, more bad thoughts, more negative things to discuss. We. We got an injury report from Hornets PR. That's not so good. Yeah, we got to read it, though. Take your medicine, folks. Next. Welcome back, people. You recognize it, I think, from last year. It's our rotation guide. Doug has curated it once again. Explain to the people, Doug, what we have not only for the listeners, the watchers, the viewers on YouTube, but also the people that only consume us via an audible space. Yeah, look, I'm trying to make sense of all this. I've got a document here. I'll share it. I'll share a link to it uh, in the description, probably on every com. And so I've got the start. I've got some starters. I've got some reserves. I've got some uh oh. I've got some swarm. I've got James <laughs> Naji is in Spain. I've got uh, a whole column come back, for him. James. No, <laughs> come on. Spain. Yeah. He's injured right now. I don't think he's ever coming back. That's true. And lost in cap space where I have Reggie Jackson. Don't know if he's going to play for the Hornets. Probably not. Seth Curry got waived, uh, but there was some idea that he might return. And then Miles Bridges lost in cap space right now. There's, there are too many questions. This is so preliminary. There's too many questions to be answered yet that I don't have any kind of minutes in here for any guys yet. But I've got LaMelo Ball, Josh Green, Brandon Miller, Grant Williams, Mark Williams as the starters. I've got Trey Mann behind LaMelo Ball and Meechich behind him. And I only did that because I think Meechich is your better point guard option. But I think Meechich is gone. Like, I just I don't see him returning next it season. It feels like that. It, it does. It feels like, like that, yeah. which means it's probably not going to happen. It means Meechich is probably going to suit up whether he likes it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, behind Josh Green, I have Cody Martin and then Nick Smith Jr. I'm just giving Cody the edge because of the defense, because of the two way play, because of the. Of of the veteran presence, but Nick Smith Jr. way better shooter, so you know he might actually have the edge. Then Brandon behind Brandon Miller, I've got Salon behind Grant Williams, I've got Pokashevsky, and then Bertans, and then Richards behind Mark Williams. Okay, my first question is all really about Cody Martin. Does yeah. Josh Green's 
uh, acquisition mean it's the end of Cody as a meaningful player when healthy for this squad? Because you have him as a starter, and I would agree. I think you'd put Josh Green ahead of Cody Martin right now if yes. it came down between those two guys. A lot of it probably does have to do with health. But remember when we would go, and I think just better offense player too in Josh Green. But I will say, remember when they hired Steve Clifford after they got rid of Borrego? We were trying to figure out who Cliff's guys might be on this team. And mm -hmm. we hypothesized JT Thor was a popular answer. Honestly, didn't really work out. But I don't think it was because Cliff didn't like him. It just didn't work out because of Thor. Who are Charles Lee's guys? And it feels like Cody Martin, Doug would fit right into that mold as somebody that Lee particularly likes. So it doesn't mean that Cody would get traded, although it's a nice tradable contract. Eight million, 2025, 26 is not guaranteed for Cody. So it's really only three years, I guess, guaranteed. And then that fourth year is non. So it'll be an easily tradable deal if you wanted to. Um, or you could just have him as some bench help, not have to rely on him so much like you did defensively last year. And then when he was hurt, you didn't have anybody to help you. It, yeah, all that considering, is this the end of Cody Martin in a Hornets uniform as a important player when healthy? I mean, the contract number for Cody Martin would help get a deal done. The problem is that the injuries have bottomed out any kind of player value because he hasn't yep. been able to progress as a player, and also teams are going to be concerned with how many games he's missed. So he would be part of a deal only in the sense – that it could make the money work. There are a number of reserves that the Hornets have right now in Trey Mann and uh, Nick Richards I would and Davis Bertans that would be interesting trade pieces either because of their contracts like Davis or because of their potential as players. Uh, Nick Richards, I mean, somebody's going to need a backup, some backup center depth, and his contract is perfect. And then Trey Mann, I think some, some team could see the upside. I hope the Hornets see the upside of Trey Mann and retain him. Uh, but so there, there are a lot of questions here. I don't think it's the end of Cody Martin this season, but it is important to note, Walker, that he is extension eligible on July 6th, and I don't think he's going to get an extension. I, I'm go. actually right. pretty certain about that. Um, mentioning deadlines, though, there are a, a few others. Pokashevsky has his contract guaranteed, I believe, on the 8th. And then Bryce McGowan's, um, who I have over here in the swarm category, still still not breaking the rotation. Well, I guess I could slot him in the uh-oh slot in the in the second wing. Feels pretty uh-oh for Bryce right now, I would say. That's well, his how, contract yeah. is is non-guaranteed up until July 18th, I believe. I may have Poku and Bryce swap there. One is yeah. the 8th and one is the 18th. But they're both making around $2 million, and they are both slated to be guaranteed, full season guarantees, um, this July. So the Hornets have to make calls on both of those. And I would say for me, Poku is a 50-50 because, look, seven-footer who has a potential to shoot, a big that can actually shoot, did some interesting things. Like, I think he's worth hanging around for $2 million. Uh, but you still got It feels gotta, like he'll be in that space forever, though. Like, hey, man, yeah. this guy can shoot. He's seven feet. We should hang on to him for $2 million. I feel like that's going to be the sales pitch as to whatever team holds on to him. Uh, once the Hornets drop him, there's going to be another team that has that same well, sales pitch to ownership and say, hey, I like it. Why not sign him? So. It, well, and I've talked on this show before about how you've got Charles Lee coming in and Jeff Peterson, and all they're talking about are guys that are – Character guys, no nonsense guys, work hard, play on both ends of the floor. And Poku in the past has gotten a little bit of a label of a diva who wants to, who views himself as a unicorn, but isn't a unicorn that tries to do too much. Now, I don't know if that's how he is anymore post flaming out in OKC, but you know, that's why I have it at 50 50. I'm not sure how he's going to react to, to the new way that things are happening here in Charlotte. So we'll have to see. But but Bryce, I think it's purely about play. It's just like, yeah, where where does he fit? I'm not sure anymore. I'm not sure they're sure anymore. So I would put that more at like 75, 25 that they don't renew that or they don't uh, guarantee that contract through this season, and they do the same thing that they did with Seth Curry and say, you know, good luck. We're going to try to find some options elsewhere because KJ Simpson. You know, we talk about these injuries. 
Like, he's going to be back. Salon's fine. Like, you've got to find time to help develop these rookies this year, too. Bryce has had his opportunity and just hasn't been able to fully take advantage of it. All right, so we've procrastinated long enough. Let's get to the bad news. You just mentioned the injury news. Hornets PR put it out, and so did Rod Boone with a little more detail. I'll just read Rod Boone's tweet sequence here yesterday. He said, Hornets Summer League team news to Jean Salon and KJ Simpson will not be participating in Summer League minicamp in Sacramento this week. Per the team, Salon suffered a minor laceration near his knee, but is expected to be available for Las Vegas Summer League later next week. So that's good. However, Hornets say Simpson will miss the entire Summer League slate after suffering a hamstring injury during the pre-draft process. Team says he will continue his rehab. He's expected to be fully recovered, which is nice, and available at the start of training camp. But the joke, not so joke, that everybody made once K.J. Simpson, a point guard, was drafted was not, oh, hopefully he can break the rotation. Oh, man, maybe he is a break glass in case of emergency guy in the regular season. No, it was thank God we have a summer league point guard, and that has been taken away from us because, (laughs) well, Hornets summer league. That exists, and we can't have nice things. Yeah, we've got a full summer league preview coming up later in the week. We have some idea of what the roster looks like, but it's still coming together, so we're waiting a few more days before we put that preview together. Uh, But, yeah, disappointing that K.J. Simpson, who, again, said he was ready to run through a brick wall, and now he's got to sit down. It was going to be exciting to see exactly what they got in that player. So you're not going to see Salon in Sacramento, but it is good that we will see him somewhat at summer because so many times we've seen Hornets draft players that miss their first summer, and that has ripple effects. Uh, Particularly for a player in Salon that is going to need some significant development you know, you don't want to see him missing too much time. So listen, I get um, I, I get the inclination to be supremely disappointed by this news, but it's not terrible news. Injuries are a part of the NBA. They've just been so significant for the Hornets, and they've targeted the most important players on the roster that there is some just inbuilt trauma that I think for the next season, two seasons, it will be ridiculous in that any slight injury news is going to irritate the bowels of the sicko and make you vomit. Well, And it, at, yeah. some, at some point, I would just encourage you to allow some healing to take place, to, to make some room for an injury to occur and it not be the end of the world. Well, I'm going to fire off some Twitter jokes still, okay? You can't talk me <laughs> out of that. As soon as That's fine. <laughs> what, what are we doing? It's Twitter. I'm here for the jokes, people. But in all seriousness, I will say, like, I am really disappointed in KJ Simpson not being able to play Summer League. Like, yeah. that sucks. And that's yeah, a legitimate totally. thing because, it, yeah, like, here we are talking about Brandon Miller struggling in Summer League last year. And then he goes into the NBA and is really good. It's because. A point guard helps so much with this squad, spreading things out, getting guys in the right position. Now we are in a spot where I don't know who the summer league point guard is going to be. And I look, we should give this front office the benefit of the doubt based off what they've done since the NBA trade deadline. But yeah, it sucks with KJ. Like, and, I, and I'll say this. I don't know how hot a take this is. It's as hot as summer league take can be. Doug, I would have said KJ Simpson had a great shot to be the leading scorer for this squad. Wow and may have been the best player on this team if we were to just evaluate who had the best summer league stint three-year player out of colorado averaged 20 points per game was dishing out assists was also a good (laughs) rebounder like what do you want it felt like he could be one of those guys that would have been the best summer league player on this team depending on like mcgowan's or whatever but like kj could have been that guy to me well this is some this is some serious nick smith jr erasure if kj simpson were your best player coming out of summer league that would to me signal the end of nick smith jr um in this rotation and and going to nick smith jr if he does have to play some more point guard, if there is a silver lining, we could see if there has been some improvement in his passing, which is something that I harped on last season, uh, not because I expected him to be an elite passer, but because he wasn't making just sort of functional basic passes, particularly in transition, which is going to be important. Charles Lee is going to be looking to get it up and down. So everybody's got to be able to, to make those functional passes. So Nick Smith Jr., you're going to get, I think, a better look at some of the improvements that he's made. But I think you're right, Walker. I just, you know, 
in my lifetime, I would like to witness <laughs> the Charlotte go. Hornets win a summer league championship. That's all I want. That's all I want is just yeah. in my lifetime to see them yeah. hold up the summer league cup. Yeah, I would love it too. Okay. We can go through the schedule next episode. Still, lots of things to celebrate. This is a really good move. Just smart for this team. They acquire Josh Green for a couple of second round picks. They go get him in the Clay Thompson to Dallas deal. And we have something to talk about this free agency period, buddy. Pleasure doing business with you. Love talking some actual news here during free agency. By the way, I called the Clay Thompson to Dallas. You thought Clay was going to go to L.A. I, well, you you thought Wendy thought that Clay was going to go to L.A. I told you it was going to be Dallas. I'm not saying you got it wrong. I'm saying Wendy got it wrong. <laughs> what was this weird flex that you had to fit in before we got out of here? Well, it, well hold on. I'm going to tie it back because that does leave an opening. In Los Angeles, I think the Clippers are they're out. I think they've they've already filled enough roster spots, but I think there's still a gap there in L.A. I think Chicago's still doing weird things. Utah, I I think there are still some sign and trade possibilities as the market continues to dry up, options continue to dry up for teams that are looking to compete. I think that's where the opportunities are going to be for. Miles Bridges sign and trade for the Hornets to bring back some more assets there. And we'll talk about it once if it happens here on Lockdown Hornets. We're with you daily. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods. That includes YouTube. Go check out Doug Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. Listen to me talk about all this stuff again on Sports Radio 927 WFNZ every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be on standby for any breaking news, any emergency pods that might need to happen, and just your regularly scheduled programming. See you tomorrow.